Hello and welcome to our final Wisdom T20 World Cup daily podcast. England are world champions. They are the first men's side to simultaneously hold both World Cups after beating Pakistan in the final at the MCG. I'm Yazron and with me today is Phil Walker and Mark Butcher. But before we get into the specifics of the game too much, England are World Cup winners. They hold both World Cups and it's fair to say that they've showed range in this tournament, chasing down 170 with four overs left. In the semi-final, then a couple of nervy chases where the bowlers have done most of the legwork. They just have more bases covered and more paths to victory than any other team at the moment. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's fair. Um, and, and if you think about all of the players that they are, they, they were unable to pick as well. Um, you know, guys like Archer, who obviously injured Topley, who would have started, I'm sure, in, in every game had he been available. Um, you know the, the myriad of players that would, of course, then misses out the last two, the last two big games. Um, you wouldn't have imagined that England it would be England's bowling that has that has won them the World Cup. Um, you know, you, you look down the list, and somebody like Livingston has, has probably faced only twenty balls in the entire tournament. Um, with Curran and Wokes waiting to come in behind, you would have thought it, it was the batting that would that would sort of batter teams into submission. But it's been the the, the bowling, defensive bowling. Um, when teams are trying to set totals, that have been that's been magnificent. I mean, they were they were absolutely sensational in the first half. Um, throttled Pakistan. I thought if that you know I was sort of texting one or two people watching around the world, and, and I said I thought if they got one four five, that it would be a very very tricky chase. And obviously, you weren't to know what was going to happen to to Shaheen. Mm. But um, but they didn't they didn't look like getting anywhere near that. Um, and Sam Curran once again. Absolutely unbelievable, and again, a role a role that perhaps you would never have put him down for. He had never really performed um, a great deal for England in his T Twenty career, and he's just been from from the first game to the last has been utterly sensational. The Cincinnati kid reading reading the hands of of all of the batters around the world and, and coming out on top was just fantastic. Mm. Phil, where do you reckon this England side compared to the other great limited overs teams of years gone by? Um, that they hold both World Cups, they get to pretty much every knockout stage they can get to. Um, like you got to start talking about. I mean, Rashid said at the end of the game, you've got to cherish these moments because they don't come that often. Well, they kind of do with England, and you, and you wouldn't really bet against them to to do it again next year in India in the 50 over World Cup. Where do you think it compares to you know the Australia side that won consecutive World Cups in the 90s, or even the West Indies side of the 70s? Uh, they deserve to be in the same conversation without a doubt. You know that they are they are history makers in a in a modern modern landscape that is is you know quite messy and muddled and the ultra professionalism of the modern era you would think you wouldn't have a team that is streets ahead both in attitude and uh thinking and conception um and balls as well just to keep going to keep backing yourself to be so wedded to that philosophy uh they are doing things that other teams just haven't got with yet and that in the modern era is extraordinary so you do look at that West Indies side that obviously won in 75 and 79 and should have should have won in 83 against India they were still the best side across the best part of a decade and they were doing things that were unheard of at that time and the Australian side rewrote the rules as well under under Ponting in particular that 03 side of the world in the world cup again he had Andrew Simons at six it just kept going so it was a blueprint there for what you're seeing now with this England side but undoubtedly, they deserve to be a part of that conversation. They are one of the great white ball teams that we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. I tell you, it was a great bluff as well from from Butler all the way back in September, sort of saying, "Oh, well, you know, it's a bit of a free hit for us this World Cup. It's very early in our cycle. We, you know, we, we don't we're not expecting you know too much of ourselves." And I, I remember calling bullshit um, at the time when I heard it. <laughs> I just you just look at the look at the resources um, and personnel that they have. And just think, well, it's just a, it's such a such a dangerous team, and they still haven't played that well yet. I mean, the semi final performance is arguably the, the performance of the tournament um, from any team um, to dismiss India in such a in such an offhand manner. Really, in that semi final was quite extraordinary. Um, but the final, it was you know it was nervy, it was tense. Um, you know, who knows what might have happened had uh, Harry Brooks devastating. Um, drive to long off, not knocked out Shaheen Charafridi. I mean, crikey, that was that could have been uh, that could have been a very different story. Um, but they, but they're the best team in it, best team in it, and haven't played that well. I, I, I would say um, uh, on on surfaces that 
that have that have kind of have narrowed the gap. I think a little bit. I think if if again if you'd been playing, if we'd have seen um, flat pitches and, and and whatever, then then England might have been might have run it by even bigger margin um, across the whole tournament. But the, the pitches have been relatively spicy. Some of them have not been particularly good, um, and that has kept everybody a little bit closer together. But England mm. still, as uh, as Phil says, streets ahead. Mm. Yeah, just coming in there. Yeah, sorry. I think it's a really good point that the, the playing field probably was leveled off a little bit. And but as you said at the, at the top of this thing, they have so many different ways of getting the job done now, uh, and they're so well drilled because it's been so long in the making uh, that whatever is thrown at them, they have options. They have that sort of learned versatility now in the side. Um, it would have been terrifying if the boundaries had been 10 yards shorter and the pitches had been, you know, a little bit flatter. Mid Midsummer Australian pitches, my words. Uh, what they've done here uh, is demonstrate that they have a they have a formula that is that is not quite unbeatable, but not far off. Uh, mm. And just the, the echoes with 19 are uncanny. The, the necessity to play desperate cricket, the necessity to you can't make any mistakes. Uh, and for mortals like me and you, Yaz, I was even going to count you, Butch, but you did play 70 games for England, so I'll give, I'll give you one off. But for us, we think, how do you do that? How do you grow? How do you get bigger in that kind of pressure cooker situation, right? For club cricketers like me and you, we it's baffling. It's as baffling as how you face someone who's molding 90 MPH and you don't get knocked out. Uh, but that's what they've done. And Butler in particular, it flows from him and Stokes and the two of them have grown into that pressure. It's like they go looking for it. It's almost like they're sort of testing themselves. It's that baseball line. Where do you, how far can you, can you take it? Psychologically, how far can you take it? And after that Island game, they sat themselves down, gave themselves a bollock in and since then they've just been unstoppable, irresistible. There, there was a really interesting quote. I think Athers mentioned it on commentary that, um, that, incredible scoop shot that Butler hit for six off Nassim Shah. So Nassim Shah basically bowled the perfect over. He beat Butler, I think, five times in six balls, but the other ball was a scoop that went for six. And Atherton said that Butler kind of second-guessed himself at times during the 2019 World Cup final. There were a couple of times where he thought about playing the scoop, but then in, a, in an instant thought, well, we're in a World Cup final, I don't want to get out playing the scoop shot. And this time he was going into the game thinking, no, I'm going to do it. And he did do it. But that's just an incredible thing to lean on to be like, yeah, I've, I've played a World Cup final. I know what that's like. And that just an, a, a, a massive advantage that England have now. Just like because they're so good, they have so much experience in these big games. They, they do. And, and uh, you know, sort of throwing it forward, I suppose, you know, Harry Brook, people will be sort of thinking, oh, what's all the hype about Harry Brook? He's not really done a great deal in the tournament. Um, you know, the next time England play one of these one of these World Cups, which comes around pretty quickly, um, he's he's got a he's he got a World Cup winner's medal. <clears throat> he's been there, he's had the experience, um, and will be will be by far a better player for that. Um, you know, just a word on a word on Stokes. Um, you know, the, unashamedly sort of pointed him and him and Milan and that sort of position up in the top of the order with with both of them playing a similar sort of role and saying there was no no place for having both of them in the team. It turned out Milan ended up not playing because of the injury. But of course, who would you rather have at the crease in, in any sort of situation such as that, particularly when the when the rate gets down to just above a runner ball, just to go out there and go just go and get the job done. Mm. Go and get the job done. Um, you know, he had a couple of hairy moments, could have been run out, had a couple of swipes and, and got away with it. But in the end, um, you know, once once the the end was in sight, that he was he was exactly the man for that situation. And I still I'm still I'm still baffled by the whole by the idea that he didn't walk to the crease at number three. That they kind of once again slotted another player in in front of him, albeit Phil Salt, who's very dangerous. But my my preference would still have been for to have Stokes come out there and maybe kept Salt back for for later on. Um, just meaning that the likes of Brook and and and, and Livingston had when it was their turn, had a, had a bit more time at, at the crease. But I think England have won, won the World Cup and still haven't quite nailed exactly what it is that they're trying to do with the, with the batting order. Yeah. Um, but of course, it, it meant that they had they had unbelievable options with the ball. Um, you know, three guys who can bowl at the death with Jordan in there as well. Um, you know, Dil Rashid, stunning again. Um uh, just a just a team that is so full of options that at times you're almost over blessed. You kind of like you're not, not entirely sure what to do. 
mm. with it all. I mean, when when Mo came out to, instead of Livingston um, after the after Brooks dismissed, I was kind of thinking, wow, another interesting decision because of course they got the two left-handers in together with uh, Nassim Shah bowling those thunderbolts. Across, you know, Ben Stokes didn't get a bat on until five in the previous over, and they sent out another lefty to come. I'm kind of thinking, well, why have they done that? Why did why wouldn't you send you know the leg the leg side hitting Livingston to come in against the guy who's drifting the ball sort of in and across the left-handers, but you know. Tactically, I don't think it was always 100% spot on. Pressure cooker, all those types of things. But they still still won it. Won it with an over at spare. Mm. Phil, just get your thoughts on... Just forget your thoughts on Stokes, really. I mean, it's the third time that he's been there at the very end of a World Cup final. It's the second time he's done it um, at the end of a tricky run chase. Um, he is quite literally a champion cricketer. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nasser said it at the end. Uh it's Ben Stokes. It's always Ben Stokes. <laughs> um, now, there is a, there's a, look, I, I don't begin to give you any kind of, kind of insight into this, right? But there is a, there is a mystery around the greats, how they bend a situation, a game scenario to their will. How the hell do they do this? And you saw it with the greats of the great. You saw it with Ward, how often it, the game would just be malleable in his hands and you get that with Stokes now just as the the, the 80 odd not out three years ago in the final at Lords was crabby in parts and a bit a bit filthy here and there and he was clothing it a bit Butler was the only person mm -hmm. to climb it and yet there were still those moments of inspirational genius towards the at the back end of that innings and he got it done he also got it done by punching one off the back of his bat unbeknownst <laughs> to him for six so again, <laughs> these things don't happen to normal people. They no. don't happen to normal cricketers, not even good cricketers. They only happen to the special chosen ones. And he is that. So this, this innings today, as Mark said, he played, he wafted at four, four in a row, I think, mm. from Nassim Shah. Played and missed literally eight times, I think, across the, the course of the, the innings. He got hit on the glove. He, the run out was a crucial moment. Look, we'll come to Pakistan in a moment. Unlucky, by the way. Everything yeah. that could have gone wrong for them did go wrong. That run out, he, he was out again, only what, six or seven yards away, two and a half stumps to aim at. If he'd gone there, they'd probably gone. He clothed one up to Baba on the half volley and yeah. then took 10 from two to basically ice the game. So and the, and the, and the six, the six only, you know, was like fingertips above the man at long off as well. I mean, he didn't, he didn't nail that as well. It's just kind of, Oh my goodness me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that, that six was very, very similar to one of his sixes in, in Headingley. It was where, when the, the crowd went silent at Headingley for one of them to only just went over. I think it's Hazelwood's header long off. Um, yeah. I think it's fair to say, I mean, well, he was 24 of 34 at one point. The required rate got up to 8.5 when it had been at six. There's one period where Stokes was three off his last 14 balls. England properly stalled after the drinks break. And I think my praise of Stokes is with an awareness that I still don't think he is like an elite T20 player, yet he is still in a format that he still doesn't really play that much of, hasn't really conquered other than in a World Cup. He's still able to shape a World Cup final and make sure he gets his team over the line. Um there are a lot of players in that England team who I just feel very happy for that they've won a World Cup. Moeen wasn't there at the end of 2019. Uh, his innings was really crucial, by the way, 19 off 12, just as the rate was, was going up. Chris Jordan, that's his first World Cup. Brooke Livingston, Rashid's now a two-time World Cup winner. But Sam Curran has just been a joke all tournament. Uh, 13 wickets, um, impeccable at the death pretty much every time with the exception of the India game. But... He is so he's been so good this tournament, and for a long time we've been wondering what is Sam Curran's career for England going to look like? What's he going to excel as? And it's kind of from nowhere really is is this death bowler who's at the moment probably um, above all other death bowlers in the world. Mm, yeah, I mean, and he just you just feel that he's going to get somebody out every time he's got the ball in his hand. He's unbelievably smart, Sam. Unbelievably smart. He's got a little bit of extra extra pace from somewhere. Obviously, the rehab from from back injuries, um, you know, has to be unbelievably rigorous. So there's a little bit more strength there. He still looks like he's twelve. So I mean, you know, he can, he can that can increase as well. I think he still fancies himself as a batter more than a bowler. Um, you know, he's he's a very very talented <laughs> lad, um, and he goes from being somebody who perhaps is on the periphery um, for for England in white ball cricket to being first name on the sheet. It was a, it was a stunning performance from him. 
because you can, you know, the fifer that you picked up early in the tournament, you can say, oh, well, you know, so they're having a bit of a slog and sometimes it falls like that. You know, you pick up five, but every single game with the, uh, with the exception of the, the, the semi-final, he was in the thick of it. He was either, he was either stalling, you know, stalling a, a, a charge from the opposition batting lineup in the early part of it um, by picking up wickets or he was nailing his, his Yorkers and his, his bouncers and his slow balls at, at the end. Um, player of the tournament stuff. It was, you know, he's so, so clever. I think that's the, the, the idea. The idea that there is some sort of fortune in what he does and how he's being able to get people out has got to have disappeared long ago because he just works people out beautifully. He understands the angles that he has. He understands, it's almost like he knows exactly what the batter's thinking as he gets to the crease. He hits the crease and suddenly thinks, okay, I'll, be, I'll ping this one a little bit short. This one's going to be the Yorker. And every single time he makes the call, he, he does exactly what the batter mm. doesn't want. And that is, mm. you know, there's the side. I played with somebody who was like that, um, Adam Holyoke, whose career, I suppose, for England wouldn't wouldn't back this up. But bowling at the death um, for Surrey <laughs> over, over a course of many, many, many years, he used to pick up wickets. I think he got 40 odd wickets one year, bowling all of his, virtually all of his overs off the reel at the end in the, in the Sunday that he was the over game. And he would just, he just knew, he knew what was coming. Mm. Um, and picked up wickets by the hatful because of it. Um, and Sammy seems to have that similar sort of feel for the situation and understanding of, of what's going on. And and he does a lot of research. He does a lot of, mm. you know, he he knows where the batter's strengths are, and he and he does everything he can to stop them from from using them. Mark's absolutely right. He 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 has an intuitive feel for a game of cricket that mm. uh, is part learned but, and also part innate, I think. But mm. if you if you're looking for a a cricketer to come through then you could go far worse than him he was this he's the son of a brilliantly resourceful cricket uh, international cricketer in Kev, kevin curran so sadly not with us anymore um but he was a superbly resourceful cricket mark would have played with him probably early in your in your career and, mm -hmm. and then he's got an older brother as well to sam he's got an older brother who's an international cricketer himself now people who have siblings in sports families you you're, you're one mark actually you know what it's like right there's an extra kind of edge in the air then mm. he has a younger brother who's also playing cricket as well professionally <laughs> so and then he turns up at surrey at what 16 and tom says to the coaches at surrey if you think i'm a useful cricketer you wait till you see my little brother and he's in that surrey side from a very very early age and he's doing things under in in pressure situations for surrey taking the new ball as a kid and then he then he's fast tracked into an england squad and people can't quite figure out what he is especially at test match level he's not is he quick enough is he a top seven bat? Blah blah blah. He comes in, and he and he affects games of cricket even at that level. So there is this perfect alchemy of of for what you're looking for in a young cricketer. He's nerveless. He's clever. He knows his way around every every competitive instinct out there, uh, and he backs himself innately. Backs himself, uh, and you see that there's a sort of quiet confidence about the kid. Uh, it, it's been a it's been a kind of coming out tournament for him if you like player of the tournament uh and yet when we, when we were talking about this six months ago there was he was he was gonna be butler's man butler knew what, what he was working with and i think he was aware of that quite a long time ago perhaps more than we were yeah i just say on we're, we're talking about and we're talking in the office like what makes him so good at the moment i think one he's just very accurate so quite often when I mean, it's an obvious point to make, but if, you, if you've got really good figures at the end, you've got to make sure that your first two overs are also... His first two overs tend to not go for very much at all at the moment. He just doesn't bowl bad balls in the new ball when he bowls in the middle. And then he is basically the only death bowler in the world who is also a death batter. So he knows exactly what batters don't want to face. So he bowls a ball that I don't see many others bowl, which is a length ball that's very wide of off stump, but it's basically as far out of the arc as possible. Um, no one else really does that. And I think he must be thinking, like we're saying he's a very clever cricketer, but he's also just drawing on his own experience as as a guy who who tries who bats at the end um, a lot as well. Um, the other star of the ball for England, Adi Rashid, unbelievable again, bowling a wicket made in the T20 World Cup final. We looked up, that's the first time someone's ever done that outside the power play. Um, Mark, we, 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 you, you uh, shut down his critics on, on, the, on the last pod. Um, but he was so good yet again. Well, just the confidence in him, isn't it? It's kind of it started to build um, in that in the last match against uh, last group game, the Sri Lanka game, and he bowled magnificently in the semi final, and, and it got better again here. Um, again, that sort of fact finding that that's, that spinners have to do in the in the early two or three deliveries. 
Um, and, he, and he saw one go, didn't he? He saw one spin and then just bowled it slower and just got slower and slower as he went, you know, slowest, slowest spell that he bowled in the entire World Cup by quite some considerable margin as well, four or five Ks. Um, and you know the the the, the spit and the venom in, in both leg break and and googly and, and ally that with the fact that when when Adil's at his very best, the ball is always pitching around middle stump. Mm. You know, so you've got you've got a call to make. You've got to you've got to pick it because he's not giving you the width to to kind of give you that time to to make up your mind what's coming down. Did Baba like a kipper with the googly again? Um, and um, as just he's, he's just utterly priceless for England. Utterly mm. priceless, isn't it? There's no other way of describing it. That, 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 that Baba delivery is iconic in its own way. That that will be replayed down the line on Sky for many years to come. If you look at his hand position, there's so such tiny discernible difference from the, the leg break that he bowled the previous over uh, almost exclusively. You know, if, if you see some of the greats bowl a googly, then you can see it coming a mile off. With him, he has such immaculate, exquisite skill and sleight of hand that that he does the best. And mm. Barber is cutting that ball until he's clothing it from his, <laughs> off his hip, off the top of the belt, the stickers. Yeah. No, it's a, it's just a masterful piece of work. And mm. that wicket maiden to Ithacar, uh is just a, it's a masterpiece. It's mm. a masterpiece. Hang it in the Louvre. It's a masterpiece. Mm. <laughs> Phil, I, I, at the end of the game, I felt a little bit more flat than I would expect to feel after England won a World Cup. You're jaded, think... mate. You're jaded. It happens to us all. <laughs> but I think it's because of the Shaheen injury. I think we we're potentially on course for an all-time classic World Cup final finish. But the point that Shaheen goes off, um, England need 41 off 29. England have lost all momentum at this point. Probably still favourites, but not massively. Part-time spinner comes on. England whack him for 10 off the last two balls of that over. Two more boundaries later, the game's done. Literally eight balls after Shaheen goes off the field, the game is done. I don't know, England could have won the game comfortably if Shaheen had stayed on the field, but it's almost not as satisfying having scored the runs off the part-timers when, uh, you know, it, it, they didn't beat Pakistan at their very best, I, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, true, true. But them's the breaks, isn't it? I mean, it's it's an extraordinary injury, really. Mm. Um you know, it just looked as though he he just slid a little bit as he tried he tried to sort of steady himself underneath the catch. And I don't know whether his studs caught in the ground and his and his knee popped on him or something. But it, you know, you wouldn't have thought that something as innocuous as that would have caused him to miss the game. And you're right, a grandstand finish could could very well have been in the, in the offing had he been able to bowl it. But um, it's another one of those things, isn't it? The win, the, the mojo with England when it comes to winning these big games. You think back to 2019 and all of the. The nonsense that occurred there with Bolt stepping on the line and the and the four <laughs> overthrows and goodness knows whatever else. It's just kind of like, you know, Ben Stokes is at the crease, weird things happen. And <laughs> you know, it's just it's you feel sorry for Pakistan and their fans. Um extraordinary story for them that they that they got there, um, to be perfectly honest with you. Um but um, you know, I think uh, particularly burying, lay, laying to rest the, the ghost of the 92 World Cup and the, the magnificence of Wazim Akram and the, those two deliveries to get rid of Lamb and Chris Lewis. Um, who knows if Shaheen might have done something similar, but, I, but I, you know, we will never know, will we, mm. unfortunately? Shaheen tried manfully to come back into the attack, bowled that mm. one heart, heart-rending heart delivery, really. He, he could barely get up to the crease. Still a, still a dot ball. ball <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Still yeah, a good ball. ball. Outside of the thumb, <laughs> uh, but, the, you know, that was that was a travesty of a moment, really. Mm. And you're right. You're right. There, there, there is that sense of, from a, the position of being of a, the spectacle, going into those last few overs. England were a 65 70% chance to win the game at that point, but it certainly wasn't iced. It was a great shame to see. And all the, the marginals went against Pakistan today, I think. You know, Rizwan, another day that flies past the leg stump. Yeah, it was well outside off stump and he and, and he clatters it into his leg stump. And as we said earlier, a few catches just going on the half volley. A couple of bits of luck here and there. The run out against Stokes that didn't quite pay off. And then that injury sort of iced it for them, really. And look, the, the best team in the tournament won the tournament for sure. But yeah. you know, there'll be a few folk back in Karachi and Lahore tonight looking back and thinking... Oh man! Just with another flick of the flick of the coin, rub of the green, it would it could have been a very very different story. 
Mm. Um, Nassim Shah, with one of the great nunfers, none for 30 off his four overs. But with Nassim and Shaheen spearheading that attack, they are going to win a global trophy one day. Sure are. They sure are. I mean, they 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 just need to find some consistent run scorers, don't they? Some some some. I say consistent because you're not going to get consistency really in T20, but some more reliable run scorers. Um, and you cannot you cannot always rely on your bowlers being able to defend subpar totals. You know, they're, they're very capable of doing it, but um, but but it's not always going to be their day. And so you know, they have to find they have to find a way. To be able to put more consistent totals on the board, uh, mm. and that and that's it really. Um, but they are they are a formidable side. I mean, they fielded. I thought they fielded brilliantly today. Um, you know, some uh, some sort of uh, last dish brilliant stuff from from Harris Rao for the fast bowlers belting around the outfield. You know, they they kind of did everything right. They were just fifteen runs shy of what was a what would have been. A very very tricky total indeed mm. um, to chase down. So I mean, again, you think about where they came from and sort of like the heartbreak of losing the India game and Zimbabwe. I was I was thinking, God, oh, please don't let Mohammed Nawaz have to bowl the last over, <laughs> be involved in the last over again. The poor sod. Um, you know, they, they had no right to be in the semi finals, really, let alone mm. win the final. So I think for for them and for for Sacklane, um, my old buddy, I think that. It's a, a tournament to be to look back on very proudly, I think, for Pakistan, and something for them to build on. And some of those uh, some of those young guys playing in the PSL starting starting February, um, you know, there, there are positions up for grabs in that in that batting order behind Barbara and Rizwan for sure. Mm. Um, Phil Owen Morgan was pretty um, adamant that Par was higher, much higher than one forty at the half time. Um, he, he he, I think he said something along the lines of. Um, did Pakistan watch the India semi-final? Um, Pakistan were pretty much at an identical point at the halfway mark and it was a very similar innings to the India innings with the exception of that late blitz from Pandya, really. Do, do you think they should have gone harder? You know, England without Mark Wood, Jofra Archer, Reece Topley, it's not an elite new ball attack and you feel like if you're going to get a score against England, those are the overs to, to really go for it. But they, they did start quite slowly and kind of let England bowl to them to a degree. Yeah. I mean, for one team to play averagely, another team's got to, got to play very well. And I thought England were brilliant in the first 10 overs mm. in the way that they haven't always been in this tournament. Uh, but do, I do, you think and... Wokes, do you think Wokes, Wokes has gone a little bit under the radar for him? I think he, but, you know, because again, it, there was a toss up between whether Wokes, I had him in my starting 11 Wokes basically because of his, you know, his expertise with the new ball and being able to nip people out. But I think without without setting the tournament alight, I think he's been unbelievably reliable and bowled really, really well. Just quite, you know, as you'd expect him to do. That's what he is, isn't he? he goes goes about his business in a quiet fashion and does and does things very well, um, very very often. Um, so that's 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 been a plus, perhaps. That again, you know, he hardly he hardly appeared in England England's sort of run up to the to the World Cup. And yet, when it came down to it, he was uh, Mr. Reliable for him with a new ball. So, I just going to say, Stokes with a new ball as well. He he ends a tournament with an economy rate of less than seven, average less than 20. Um, he's not done that much bowling recently in T20 cricket. And he and he really w- could be relied upon for, for most of the part. Mm. Well, I mean, Eng- I tell you, England did, again, a, a, it was probably conditional. You know, you talk about a, a, a par score. Well, a par score for Pakistan is a different from a par score for other teams because they back yeah. their bowlers to, you know, so for them, perhaps they, 145 is par for them, whereas another team might have needed to score 160. But anyway, that's by the by. But, you know, England, I think, used the conditions really well. They knew that the new ball had swung and it had stayed swinging for longer than it than it would normally do. And so, therefore, Ben Stokes and his his particular brand of... Um, you know, zippy, zippy, swingy deliveries was suddenly a weapon that they might not have used had it been, you know, had had we been playing in Pakistan, for example. Um, and so it was a bit of a bit of cleverness from uh, from the Butler Mott think tank in terms of just you, what have we got? What do we have here? What are what are the strengths that we have in our in our dressing room? Well, one of them is we've got some guys who can swing a new ball. So there we go, Ben Stokes, you open the bowling. He might not ever do it again. <laughs> But uh, but for this tournament in the conditions that we've had, perfect. Just looking at the scorecard again. So when Baba went, it was the start of the twelfth uh, over. So they had they had nine nine well eight point five overs to go, and they were on eighty four when Baba uh, was was Rashided. Um, to only get to one three seven from there, albeit with a flaky middle order, 
that's really where it fell away for them. Liam Livingston took took three catches at the three quarter mark out, you know, on the, on the boundary. It was 15, 20 yards in from the boundary and took three catches, three dollies really for a good outfielder. Shadib, Shadab Khan clothed one up to mid off as well. In amongst it, England bowled 47 dot balls in that innings. So even, even with an with an average sort of scrappy last seven or eight overs, Pakistan should have got up to 150. Uh, they would have only required nine and over to get up there. Just just bat your overs in effect and and scrap it, you know, and big boundaries, hard run twos and all the rest of it. As it was, they sort of played into England's hands, really. I think perhaps the fear of knowing what's to come forced them to to try and go almost too hard in the end. And so it, it they came unstuck in, I think, the last last half a dozen overs, really. Mm. Um, and they they ended up going nowhere. Uh, th- and I think some with the, the great teams, that's what they do. The spectre of what's to come scares scares teams into doing up peculiar things, you know. And, and knowing what England had in the locker, uh, maybe forced them to, to to do some things that they they will look back now and regret, you know. Certain players for sure in that middle order. Although, as Mark says, they're not pedigree players, really. In truth, you know, they're still finding their way. They've got a kid at three. Of course, they've got a kid at three. If the car has had a good tournament, but's come from nowhere really, and and their their mid to late order as well is, with the exception of Shadab, is not really what you're looking for in the top top side. So, mm. yeah, um, one three seven was, was no was nowhere. That said, um, they still needed forty off twenty nine England. Yeah. Uh, so so that's that's the game. That's Pakistan for you. Yeah, there's it a great stat from Wizard India's uh, Abhishek Mukherjee who said that it's not since the 2014 T Twenty World Cup. That a side has won a knockout game batting first, and a quite familiar pattern in a lot of those games is the side batting first just starts weirdly slowly or just slower than you'd expect. Like maybe the pressure, the big occasion, and there's a bit more caution there. Um, I just wanted to finish off with just something more general on the tournament itself. Um, and one and one thing I really liked about this World Cup and something that the IPL I think at this stage just can't really touch is that conditions vary from tournament to tournament. And our opinions on T20 players for such a long time were skewed by the fact that the premier T20 competition was just the IPL. There were six years pretty much between World Cups in more or less the same conditions every year. And part of what makes cricket such a watchable sport, whatever the level, it could be on a Saturday, you could be on a, you know, a pudding one week on a road the next, is that conditions change. And I think that's why I enjoy this tournament quite a lot more than I do... Uh, watching franchise competitions because in franchise competitions it is just basically the same conditions year on year and it's exciting and very watchable seeing the best players in the world have to adapt to grounds they've not really played that much at before. I don't know what you guys think of that. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that, you know, again, I, I mentioned that the pitch is kind of, they favoured the bowlers on, on, on for the most part, which a lot of people like, you know, a lot of people get um, fed up with seeing the ball disappear out of the park. Um, so I thought that that you know again brought the level of, of teams a little bit closer together when the when the bowlers have got something in it for them. Um, you've got big bigger boundaries as well, so guys have probably got to tag it if they're going to hit it out of the park. Um, and and all of that is you know it's great seeing the ball fly through as well. You know there's, there's a different yeah. there's different skills, different range of shots have to be brought into play when you're being forced onto the back foot by blokes bowling it around your ears. So yeah, all good. I mean that's but that's the game, isn't it? You know, you, <laughs> the game of cricket is always dictated by what, but by the surfaces that you play on. Um, and the more varied they are, the more the more skill you see, uh, for, or the more skill is required from the players playing on them. And again, that kind of highlights why England, the, the the best team, have been the best team in the tournament because they've been able to go from one from one to the next, and they have all of the players in their arm, armory to be able to cope with all the different conditions that have been thrown up in the tournament. Phil. What are, your, what are your overall thoughts on the competition? Do you enjoy it? I, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, I have to say more than I was expecting to. <laughs> That's probably a glimpse more into my own attitude than, than, than anything else. Um, uh, it's, it, it, it's the narratives for me are the first week and a half seeing the gap between the so-called minor nations, minnows, whatever, and the established old order. The gap is ever more... Uh, minuscule uh, and that 
secures the future of the game in so many ways for me. And it's a more democratic game. It's a more open hearted game now, I feel. Uh, there are players that I've never heard of who I now have heard of. There's stories that you really want to attach yourself to. The story of Zimbabwe coming through, the story of the UAE winning their first ever game in, in the thing, how how well Ireland played to get there, um, turned the West Indies over, humiliated the West Indies. I mean, just say that sentence out loud 20, 30 years ago. So look, this has been a tournament for the, for the world game, first and foremost, I think. Uh, and Australia puts on a show. Forget that it's pissed down for <laughs> half a dozen games. If we can gloss over that fact, and incidentally, great, we got a game out, by the way, this this morning, this evening. But I think I think it's been a triumphant tournament. I genuinely do. Um, and uh, I have to say, it's it's the narrative, the final narrative is is the right one because this team, for four or five years, really, they've been doing things that no other team has thought of doing before. And so I think the the the, the winners are are rightly lifting it this evening. Mm. I think that's a big, shout out, big shout out to big shout out to Rob Key. Yeah, right. <laughs> Penny yeah. for a high performance review, folks. That's, well, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, the, it's the, the victory can be laid firmly at the door of the hundred as well. I, I imagine, you know. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Oh, turn, turn your notifications off, Mark. Whatever you do, all right. Have a nice Sunday. <laughs> I think I think we can save all of that for the for the next podcast. Um, cheers for listening, folks. Cheers for bearing with us through all the dailies. Um, thanks to all the contributors we've had on it, as well as our regular cast people like Matt Roller, Cam Ponsonby, etc. It's been great having them on. Um, cheers, Mark. Cheers, Phil, and cheers for listening. Um, if you have enjoyed it and if you've listened to most of the dailies, please do consider giving us a favourable review wherever you listen to your podcast. Cheers. <laughs>